Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page, where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley bestselling author and a PhD in Spanish and French literature, but someone whose attention has been totally, as some of you know, taken up by Irish fiction in the last few years. So um, this is my most recent addition to my obsession with Ireland. Well, it's not even, it's not, it's, I mean, it's a little bit with Ireland, but mostly with Irish fiction. But before we dive into Megan Nolan's unbelievably great Ordinary Human Failings, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. One is a message that I should be repeating far more often than I am, which is that uh, I really hope everyone understands that yes, I am guiding you, I am giving you some tools, but it is supremely important for everyone to recognize something that just um, you know came to top of mind because I was listening to the incredible Greta Gerwig speaking uh, to Mark Maron on his podcast, and she was talking about um, the beauty of art as, as being open and open to interpretation and open to everyone's own sort of projection onto a given piece of art. And it is supremely important for me that all of you listeners out there know that yes, I am giving you, um, you know, some of my interpretations perhaps, uh, but I hope that I am leaving things open enough. And I hope that you know that, uh, you know, an interpretation of yours is so valid and is so important. In fact, it's perhaps the most important thing. Um, I will remind you though, what uh, Daniel Mendelssohn has said, which is that we need to be very rigorous when we are making uh, assertions about literature. He likes to approach literature as if it were sort of like a data science moment in that you can only assert uh, you know, a, a thesis about a piece of literature if you have a lot of data to prove your thesis and if there is no evidence to the contrary of your thesis. So I'm not going to hold you to those standards. You can just have what interpretation you want to have, but I really want to underscore the importance of, of me not sort of dictating the way that I am interpreting something. And instead, um, I really would like to invite you to have your own interpretations of things. And I hope that the tools I am providing you are allowing you, you know, to come to your own conclusions, but perhaps in ways that are a bit richer and a bit more, uh, not necessarily more deep, but more sort of nuanced than they might have been uh, if you had not listened to a given lecture. The other thing, very quickly, is you're going to want to check out the uh, Fox page Instagram if you are an Instagram user. There is a lot of, um, you know, excellent, uh, if I don't say so myself, content on there. There are also incredible weekend giveaways where you just have to comment on something and, and then magically, if I draw your name, a, an incredible sort of care package will arrive in your mailbox. And uh, I also would like to say, if you are listening on the podcast, uh, you might want to check out the YouTube channel. What, one of the best things about the YouTube channel is certainly that you get to see the images that I like to sort of feather in throughout uh, the, the lecture that I'm giving. They're not necessarily always like on the nose, although there will be pictures of given authors and whatnot, but there are also other, uh, other images that, that I think are really uh, going to add to your experience of a given text. Oh, one last thing. You can go to thefoxpage.com and there's a spinning wheel. And if you answer a few questions, uh, it will spit out a recommendation. Thank you to the readers who have told me that they really love that as a generator of recommendations. Go and check it out. Give it a, give it a try yourself at thefoxpage.com. Okay, those of you who have listened for a while know that I always like to begin with this question of why I would ask you to, uh, you know, to read a certain book or why I would ask you to spend 90 minutes or an hour or whatever it is listening to me talk about the book. And today I'm going to begin slightly differently, which is why I read this book. I was at a local bookshop. It was sitting right on the front table, which is always of interest to me, even if I don't know the booksellers particularly well. I'm just really interested in, in sort of what these uh, independent bookstores are showcasing and sort of promoting, just because I really do trust the judgment of these small bookstores. So uh, I was also, of course, drawn by the crazy cover. I think it is so good. It really spoke to uh, me as a child of the 70s. And uh, obviously the green and white of this cover really um, 
I mean, look at that. It's an incredible cover. Uh, the green and white of the cover also made me hope, in fact, that perhaps this was something to do with Ireland. I think also the name Megan Nolan also drew me. And sure enough, it is a book that has a huge amount to do with Ireland. And actually, very interestingly, a little bit of the tension, or a lot of the tension, between England and Ireland. So, I was drawn in uh, by, by the striking cover, and then I was really taken by the blurb from Carl Ove Knausgaard. So I um, am a huge fan of Knausgaard's. Uh, I don't know how much he blurbs things and how much he endorses things, but he, he says right here, a huge literary talent. And right away, I was like, wow, okay, if Carl, or I guess maybe it's Carl Ove, if Carl Ove, my um, Norwegian and Swedish are non-existent, sadly, but if he thought she was a huge literary talent, then I'm going to trust that. In my sleuthing about Megan Nolan, I realized she has spoken quite freely in a couple of different essays that she has written about the sort of debt that she has to Knausgaard. She read his work and in it saw so much uh, kind of self-revelation. She, in fact, uh, characterizes his writing as quite feminine in the sense that it was very, uh, like, very forthcoming and, and, and all and full of all sorts of vulnerability, and it made her feel like she could tell her story, which is, I think, a very apt reading of Knausgaard. She had a journalistic background. He really gave her permission to write novelistically about uh, about some issues, about her own vulnerability, and, and about things that felt somewhat frivolous to her because they were more sort of like female endeavors. Okay, lastly, the reason why I wanted to read this was because it became very clear, I think even from the jacket copy, that this has to do with the tabloids and the British tabloids in uh, particular. I was just wanting to understand a bit more about this kind of what seems like a really insidious and, and sort of terrible world. It's a little bit unlike some of the things that we have read on the Fox page. It's a little thrillery. I don't read for plot generally. And so lots of times, you know, things like The Girl on the Train or um, I can't think of Gone Girl, like some of these sort of thriller, like true crime kind of things are not that interesting to me. And so I was very taken by the, kind of the, the sort of thriller aspects of this. It's also a very good sort of meditation on truth and memory. Also, um, it's such an interesting look at family. So it, it's a it's a book that has several different points of view. It's narrated. Um, it's a close third narration, so it's a third person narration. But but it, it it aligns very closely with a few different family members. So you get this kind of vision of the family through the eyes of several different people. Okay, so I want to talk now about tabloid. I went to Etymology Online. I actually think it's like Etym Online. Etym Online? I don't know how we're meant to pronounce that. But it was really interesting. In 1884, tabloid was a small tablet of medicine. So it became tablet, you know, the little tablet, and then the Greek suffix oid. This came directly from some source material in 1885. A new and successful remedy has been found for the distressing nervous complaint known as hay fever. One sixth of a grain of the recently discovered remarkable anesthetic cocaine is incorporated into what are called tabloids and inserted into the nasal passages. Which, this just kills me too because it actually sounds like something that you would read out of the tabloid. But the fact that these tablets were like put up your nose and they had cocaine in them is, um, I mean, I guess that would solve your hay fever problems. I don't know. I have not um, ever experimented with, with cocaine. Uh, it seems like at, at the least you would like forget about your hay fever symptoms. But then they go on to say this. By 1898, it was being used figuratively to mean a compressed form or dose of anything. Hence, tabloid journalism, 1900, simplified and in the negative view, sensationalized. So tabloid as a noun, um, it referred to, to any sort of newspaper that typified this. I myself am uh, a subscriber to People Magazine. I love my people. I love People Magazine. I do take it with a grain of salt. Um, I also skip all the true crime stuff at the end, which actually is probably an important difference between Megan Nolan and myself. Megan Nolan's a big fan of true crime. Then they go on to say this. The concept and word were associated originally with British publishing magnate Alfred C. Harmsworth. He was the editor and proprietor of the London Daily Mail. And this is, in fact, what he has said. What a person wants in his daily morning paper, not long-winded essays, nor does he care to have undigested news by the column. He prefers it in concentrated tabloids with all the interesting points put prominently forward so that he can run and read. 
So we certainly have a very upfront vision of this kind of news as, as being very sensational. You know, it's kind of all the exciting stuff is up front. And I was very happy when I dug into the book to find that Megan Nolan really has done some sort of really careful thinking about tabloid journalism. She is, in fact, a journalist herself. You know, the character here, who is Tom, who is our journalist, is really uh, doing some of the thinking about what he is doing, uh, you know, the part that he is playing in the lives of these families and this murder that he is investigating. Well, he's not investigating it. He's a journalist. He's trying to sort of drum up a lot of... Um, you know, sensational stuff that he can, in fact, fit into his tabloid. So what he's doing is really pretty nefarious, but you have this sense of him as, as really being somewhat thoughtful. And I loved those parts and want to share them with you. So this is our introduction to Tom on page seven. Tom stared at himself in the lift mirror as it trundled down lit with a brutal glare. He shook his head, loosening the hair and then raking it backwards. He exhaled a long, slow sigh and then let his lips stay stuck out as it whistled to an end. He held the pout for a moment longer, squinting, then laughed nervously and stuck his tongue out, making a brief retching sound before readjusting himself back to the mannered, carefully casual stance he maintained while out on a job. This was so interesting to me. First of all, this idea of looking at himself in the mirror um, and the Daily Mirror being, um, you know, one of these big papers. But this idea of, of, of sort of looking at himself, of facing who he is the very first time we see him is so important. It, it allows us, I think, to realize that, that he is going to be doing some sort of introspection because we are signaled that right from the very beginning. It's also so interesting that he's doing all this kind of bizarre stuff, uh, like not quite obscene and not quite crazy, but like all of these different things to sort of get out all of these, uh, you know, sort of perhaps true uh, impulses on his part in order to then hide his real self or, or this kind of his real impulses behind, um, you know, this kind of facade that he will in fact keep up throughout the, uh, the novel. But then of course, once we have him meeting together with his boss, we realize that this facade, it really falls short of what he would like it to be and certainly what his boss would like it to be. He wore a Fruit of the Loom faded sweatshirt and black Levi's. His boss, Edward, had burst out laughing the first time he had seen this outfit on Tom. Are you doing a little performance as an everyman, Hargreaves? He said. Tom had flushed at this even as he laughed along. There was nothing he wanted more than Edward's approval. He had learned to live for the brief ecstasy of a good work, lad, or a knew I could count on you. So this is also so, so telling. So the idea of clothing, um, of course, is, is talking about class stuff. It's talking about all of the small ways that we signal certain things about ourselves to other people. It's about the falsehoods that we can sort of perpetrate and the way that we can convince people of certain things. And it also is so, so kind of baldly this proclamation of how much Tom really wants approval from a male authority figure. It's so kind of pathetic in the sense of like inspiring pity in us because it is so sad. Then we have um, Tom sort of re returning to his own head. Afterward, he felt aggrieved and defensive, bickering with him inside his head. These were the clothes he had worn in Margate before he moved to London and started working for the papers. They were clothes of normal people. It was only that he'd been playing at being one of the others for long enough that a return to his old home stuff looked comical and perverse. So again, this idea of, be, of playing at being someone else, when in reality, his roots are really what define him. And of course, this is something that becomes much, much more important with the family, uh, with the Greens, who are from Ireland. So this idea of, of your roots as, in fact, defining you completely is reiterated here uh, with Tom. Okay, and then we go on to really dig in to this, the papers, which Tom calls them. And the papers is interesting because he goes to work for the papers and, and you see them as sort of a block. You know, there are many of them and you know that they operate in the same way. And we really can read Tom as, as sort of every man, which his boss calls him, but every man also meaning like all of the different tabloid uh, reporters. So then we have this, peasants. That was what Edward and the others, barring a few hand-wringing employees who were biding their time to make a break for one of the lefty rags, called everyone who was not a journalist or royalty or a celebrity. 
So you have this incredible disdain for everyone uh, who is in fact their readership. So a bit later in the novel, we have another interaction with Tom and Edward, and it's, um, you know, even their names, you know, Edward sounds like a little more high flown. It's not Eddie, it's Edward, you know, so there's that kind of hierarchy and stratification, even, of course, within the tabloid itself. But we have this interaction between the two of them that was exactly the kind of like behind the scenes thing that I um, that I expected and was really hoping for in the novel. So on page 24, we have this. In Edward's office, he explained the situation as it currently stood. Firstly, what had been a functional but ultimately forgettable tearjerker, a cute kid coming to harm, seemed on its way to becoming a murder case. Secondly, it appeared that legitimate suspicion had been directed toward another child, and not just a child, but a girl. Thirdly, this girl belonged to a family of misanthropic Irish degenerates who, it was fair to assume, lived at least partially off the welfare state and had offered nothing but parasitic consumption, and now a horrific crime, to the great nation of Britain they had seen fit to settle in. So that is crazy. Talk about anti-immigrant sentiment. But we also, in, you know, in addition to that, have this manipulation and this kind of glee that Tom has at the opportunity that presents itself once they realize, in fact, that, that they can spin this up into a story that, that's all about sort of anti-immigrant propaganda. So then Edward comes back and says this to Tom. Say this is true, to whatever degree. Say the kid of family bad apples has maybe killed the kid of family do-gooder. Even if it doesn't bear out in the end or doesn't come to trial or get a conviction, it would be interesting in the meantime. 90s Britain, the battle of the council estate, feckless foreign wanderers with a whiff of abuse and chaos, turn on the deserving poor. So again, uh, this is all happening in 1990, um, which is part of the reason, which is the year, in fact, that Megan Nolan was born, but also is, uh, you know, is important just in the setting here. Here we have a little bit of this kind of black and white thinking, this this kind of sensational, like very, um, the tabloid part is like this very condensed and very easy to understand, very easy to ingest kind of information. I mean, it's all about good and evil and the nature of good and evil and why certain people could be, in fact, evil. It's such an interesting meditation. I have this dog's barking. Can you hear these dogs barking? Oh my God. Sometimes I'm just like so annoyed by my dogs. So quite a bit later in uh, the book, in 90, on page 98, as things are really kind of heating up and the plot has thickened quite considerably, we do have Tom really uh, getting in touch and really sharing with the reader how difficult the reality of the situation is for him. Absurdly, he wanted to cry. The pulsing mania helped him forget how small and alone he was almost all of the time, but this story was a new level, and the enormity of what he was doing slipped through his usual defenses. It was too much for him to be responsible for. The story was too big and upsetting and difficult, and he was only himself. He needed someone to look after him for a bit. He needed a girlfriend, maybe, or at the least, a bit of mothering. So there's some very, very important things happening here. First of all, he's he's really understanding kind of the, the magnitude and the import of the story, which is very good for the reader because we we have a lot of, not a lot, but we have some sympathy for him at this point because you really do feel like he is in over his head and that he's sort of carried on um, by, you know, desire for, uh, you know, some sort of affirmation from his boss and he needs to make money and, you know, he's doing the thing that he knows how to do, which is journalism, and he's having to do it in this tabloid way. But he really has some misgivings here that allow us to understand as readers that, you know, that, that he's not just terrible. But we also have this idea both for Tom and for all of the characters, actually, in the Green family, we have this idea of of, of everyone as needing some, some care and some love, you know, whether almost always it's from a mother and father, you know, they're just sort of not getting that kind of affection, or from a partner. There are lots of, um, you know, instances where we're having the real love of a spouse or a partner would really go a long way. But, but we have again and again this idea of people who are really lacking in support support and lacking in self-esteem and lacking in care. Um, And in fact, you know, the whole story, the sort of plot of the story really turns almost entirely on this idea of, of not being cared for. And then on 145, we have Tom thinking again. This is the last, um, this is the last little clip that we're going to look at about tabloid journalism. 
A mildly strained relationship with a stepmother and a rude, unemployed father did not lay any substantial groundwork to indicate the inevitability of evil. So again, this is like things are getting more and more desperate because as the book is moving along and Tom is is beginning to see both the possibility of this story really being gigantic and then also worrying that in fact it's going to come to nothing, um, as that tension is increasing in, in both of those ways, th- this question of evil, you, you know, good versus evil, it's like somebody having sinned or have, you know, original sin and being evil. It's like a very sort of biblical term. It's not somebody being... Um, you know, sociopathic. It's not like a clinical way to think about it. It's like a very judgmental and and very sort of, um, in some ways, a very antiquated and and again, a very like loaded word, this idea of evil and this idea of, of that he keeps sort of not being able to find true evil is really significant because the book really is a meditation on who is evil, you know, and, and can a young child, in fact, be evil. We are going to dive in first to a little bit of biography about Megan Nolan. She was born in 1990 in County Waterford in Ireland. I don't really know what that means. That doesn't have any like real uh, significance for me. On the Wikipedia, which is where I got the sort of, it mentions her father. I think he's like, does like theater, something in the theater, theater production or something like that. She did study uh, French and she studied, I believe, journalism. Uh, at Trinity College in Dublin, but did not, in fact, graduate, from from what I understand. She now lives in London, I believe, at least she did, uh, according to some of the different articles that I have read by her. I listened to a really interesting interview on a podcast called Love Lives, which was so, um, it was just very interesting and really compelling to hear her voice. I really enjoyed the interview. And a couple of things stood out to me. One is that her first book, which was called Acts of Desperation, and it was a book that was very well received and in fact that um, had her shortlisted for a couple of prizes. I believe it won uh, the Davy Byrne Prize and it was a book about an abusive relationship. And in the interview, she spoke pretty candidly with the interviewee about the fact that um, that people are so quick to assume that biographical details in novels written by women are in fact autobiography, meaning that they are true. And both she and the interviewer were really uh, sort of appalled by how many people felt entitled to ask her if she in fact had been in an abusive relationship, which I just find so, first of all, just rude. And, and second of all, so infuriating because I don't think if a man were to write a book about a, uh, you know, a domestic violence sort of abusive relationship, th- the first question that they would be asked by the interviewer is not whether or not they were, you know, in a domestic abuse situation. I, you know, Megan Nolan didn't sound particularly uh, infuriated by it, but certainly was not, um, you know, it was something that she uh, lamented, in fact, with the interviewer. The other thing that she spoke about, and she has written articles about this, is um, is her alcohol use. So, you know, Ireland, uh, to a certain degree, there, there's an assumption that people in Ireland drink a lot. And, and we've talked before, I guess when we were talking about Milkman, among other uh, among other novels, we have talked about uh, alcohol and the importance of it and, and the sort of um, the, the really destructive aspects of it in Ireland. And she spoke in these articles about the amount that she was drinking, but that she thought it was very normal because it was such a part of the culture in which uh, she was living. She also made the very interesting point that most people don't feel like they can talk about any sort of alcohol use issues until they have become sober, which I thought was so interesting. Uh, It's interesting to me that it is so kind of impossible to talk about having a drinking problem or, you know, understanding that your drinking is a little bit out of control uh, when you are still drinking. It was just a very, it was a very interesting point that she was making. It was such a candid and beautiful interview. And and I, I would also, though, discourage you from really, you know, thinking that these novels have everything to do with Megan Nolan, because in fact, they are novels, they are fiction. And I really think we owe her, you know, the, the sort of respect to read them as if they are in fact fiction, and not to try to, um, you know, guess what it is that's autobiographical, or or to sort of make our judgments or, or have even sympathy, um, because we seem to be making, drawing conclusions that may or may not be the case. So after our sort of cursory look at the biography of Megan Nolan, we are going to dive in to the text. 
First of all, I um I spoke earlier about liking the cover of the book. I, I think it's it's really I really like the layout. I love the way that this little girl is sort of suspended in nowhere. But jumping off of it, there's this idea of neglect. Um, there's clearly an idea of, of poverty here. Um, but you have this sense of, of, of things falling apart and of things being dangerous and this girl being sort of suspended. We also, of course, have the green and white, which I always read, um, you know, some, somewhat hopefully as a sign of Irishness. And I like the nod here to the Irish, um, you know, feel of the thing. And then um, we're going to dive in and take a look at the title. So Ordinary human failings. I loved this title. I have to say that in the very beginning, I wasn't sort of struck by uh, what an amazing title it is. It was really after I finished the book that I took in the full kind of nuance of the title. So um, I do want to take a look at a few times though when it is repeated in the text. You all know that um, I encourage you to read with a pencil. And one of the things that I always find myself, uh, you know, sort of noting and circling and marking up, I'm doing it right now with Pride and Prejudice. Every time the word pride comes up or prejudice, I like circle it a bunch. And it is, I mean, let me tell you, the word pride comes up a lot in Pride and Prejudice. But I would urge you to keep a lookout and to see if the title pops up in your reading. So on page 23, we have um, this note that is from Edward, from the boss of Tom, who is um, our journalist, our, our sort of tabloid journalist. And uh, we have this note from Edward. It was a note to the entire staff. Reminder, reasonable excuses for lateness, missing meetings, not doing something I told you to do, etc., include bereavement, parent only, serious illness, life-threatening, your own, Reasonable excuses do not include ordinary human failings, such as hangovers, broken hearts, etc., etc., etc. This was so interesting to me. It's early in the book. We're only on page 23, but we have, you know, the, the entire title verbatim here, Ordinary Human Failings. What's interesting to me, not only um, because it's always exciting for me to find the title, uh, but it, it's really important that it is sort of put into this male authority figure's mouth. It's also, um, I think, somewhat sort of hypocritical and crazy because this is a tabloid journalism center. And, you know, we have this idea, um, in fact, that that these people need to be very responsible and yet they are doing work that in many uh, ways can be regarded as harmful and irresponsible. So we also can look at this, though, as a really interesting sort of um, example of, of like the real extremes and the sort of, um, you know, ideals and the priorities of a place like this and its sort of judgments. So things like bereavement can only be apparent. So literally death or life-threatening illness. I mean, this is the kind of thing that that is important in the world of uh, of tabloid journalism. And then um, reasonable excuses do not include and then these ordinary human failings are hangovers and broken hearts. So those are kind of odd things to single out. I mean, there are lots of different things that you could single out, but those two are ones, first of all, that have everything to do with Tom Hargreaves. His last name, by the way, this idea of um, of uh, like Hargreaves, is this idea of like hard grieving is really important. You also have this idea of Tom as like a tomcat, as like, you know, somebody who's kind of sexually adventuresome, when in fact this Tom uh, is really sort of impotent in lots of ways. But this idea of hangovers and broken hearts speaks also to some of the really big themes in the book, which of course are alcohol abuse disorder, and also this idea of broken hearts, not, not just, you know, from boyfriend girlfriend, but like really like a heart broken by a parent, for example, or a, uh, you know, a, a, a partner. Certainly there are lots and lots of broken hearts. Hearts are breaking over and over and over again in this book. So it's really cool that at this, at this early point in the book, we have this male authority figure in, um, you know, this piece of ephemera that is like this note that's going around to the entire tabloid uh, journalism like business, that these are things that are uh, both acceptable, which are the, you know, like death, and then, um, you know, the things like uh, alcoholism and broken hearts are in fact not uh, excuses. So after the title page, um, right above all the kind of normal boilerplate stuff that they have in, in the frontest matter, frontest matter of most books, we have another um, another instance, another iteration of the cover photo, which I really love. It gives us, it's a slightly different variation. In this one, we can see the background behind the little girl. 
Um, and it's and it's really striking, and I like the repetition of it. It really foregrounds the idea of this girl who is at the center of the novel, but she is a girl who really remains elusive to us. She is one of the few people that we don't take her perspective as we move through the family, um, and she really does end up feeling sort of unknowable in a way that I found very satisfying because, in fact, um, you know, people almost always remain unknowable in very important ways. Okay, we're gonna dive in now to the very first couple of paragraphs. So I found the beginning, the opening of this book uh, really moving, um, and we're gonna take a look at the first three paragraphs. We have a part one, and then we have this, uh, this small paragraph that is typeset on its own. It is not under uh, you know the name. So below that, we have one, Carmel, but uh, this is something that is sort of outside of the scope of each of these different narrators. Down below in Schuyler Square, the trouble was passing quickly from door to door, mothers telling mothers, not speaking aloud, but somehow saying, baby gone, bad man, wild animal. So I found this so moving and, and really, really nuanced and very uh, subtle in some ways, but also just really uh, well done. Um, in Schuyler Square, this is a, you know, this is like a, a council house, a, a council apartments. So we have this. Down below in Schuyler Square, the trouble was passing quickly. So the troubles, um, as I think many, many of you are aware of, um, refer to a, a couple of different times of real strife in Ireland, and it was sort of sectarian violence and, and it, very sort of civil war type of thing in that the Protestants and the Catholics uh, were fighting against each other. Very, very complicated, very complex conflict that was happening in Ireland. And so the idea of the trouble passing from door to door, the fact that she has that de that definite article there, the trouble, um, it, it does, in my mind, very clearly echo the troubles. Um, and here we are in England. This Schuyler Square is in England. And we learn later, in fact, that this family, uh, you know, has has left Ireland because Carmel needed an abortion and um, they have left Ireland and fled to England and are not, in fact, given uh, much, you know, um, uh, a, not a very warm welcome there in England. So you have this idea of the trouble as having followed them and the trouble as being, um, you know, sort of specifically Irish in many ways. And, I, you know, I think you can look back to the idea of, of uh, the inability to get an abortion in Ireland as, uh, as, as being part of this legacy of Catholicism and, um, you know, that in some ways is the root of the trouble. I'm very sensitive right now to the fact that I am speaking about, you know, all of these... Uh, conflicts and all of these difficulties in Ireland when I am not, in fact, a historian and I am not Irish, obviously. According to 23andMe, though, I am like 48% British and Irish, which I actually find ironic because they kind of lump the two together in a way um, that I resent because the, the Irish part of me, I had a great grandmother who was Anna Louise Murphy, which is like sounds as about as about as Irish as you can get. And, and she was awesome. She was really, she was an architect and she traveled all through South America and she was just this total badass. But she um, was a woman who was very Irish. And so um, the, the Irish part of me probably resents a little bit the fact that they were just able to like lump the Irish and British together. Um, I think a lot of people do that. In fact, Megan Nolan wrote an article about how she finally, around the time of Brexit in 2018, she wrote an article um, about how, why she finally, in fact, hates English people. And it is because, in fact, of the ignorance, English people seem to have no idea, in her experience, of the fact that they were a really brutal colonialist, um, you know, force in Ireland, and that, you know, just because all those people were white, it didn't seem quite as egregious as the colonialism elsewhere, but um, certainly with Brexit and the idea of, of uh, you know, North Northern Ireland and the idea of how uh, the European Union and the UK were going to sort of divvy all these things up was extremely painful for a lot of Irish people and literally, you know, lots of British people, it just came down to like, um, you know, mercantile issues and sort of like, how would you manage trade without really any sense of, of, of the, the legacy, in fact, of British colonialism and the total eclipse of, of Irish culture and the Irish language. So um, again, I feel like I am speaking to, uh, I, I want to sort of caveat this, that I am speaking a little out of my depth here. And yet um, I really would like to say that everybody should be more educated about uh, the ways in which Ireland was colonialized, was, was colonized by uh, Britain. Okay, so we have this idea of the troubles in Schuyler Square. 
And then we have this idea of this, the troubles passing quickly from door to door, mothers telling mothers. So right at the beginning, we have the real importance of mothers. We have them foregrounded. We have the idea of mothers as being able to sort of solve the troubles, the people who can uh, protect the families. And, um, you know, in this case, in fact, the mothers have not been able to protect their families. And we have this idea of not language. They're, they're, they're not speaking out loud. And yet there is this way that they are saying to each other, baby gone, bad man, wild animal. And it's really important because this is this kind of extra linguistic thing. It's not, it's not in anyone's language. It's sort of this intuitive way that these mothers are all communicating, which really stands in opposition to the way that people like Tom Hargreaves and the sensationalist tabloids are going to want to package everything in language that is very clear and very uh, sensationalist and very provocative, all about good and evil and, and you know, easily digested and, and all sort of condensed into to really, um, you know, comprehensible buzzwords that these mothers and their intuitive language stand in direct opposition to. So just after the section about Schuyler Square and the trouble, we have um, a, a space break, and then we have the number one, and then Carmel. By the way, um, I always was saying Carmel, just because Carmel seemed kind of not right to me. Also, um, Carmel it comes from a Hebrew word and it means orchard. I uh, learned that when I was uh, doing a close reading of Foster. If you are interested in Ireland and Irish issues and Irish literature, even if you're not, you should read uh, Foster by Claire Keegan if you have not already. Claire Keegan is such a master. It is such, such incredible, uh, incredible work. So check that out. Um, but I was saying Carmel because Carmel just sounded like, I don't know, it sounded like Carmel Apple. Like it just didn't quite sound right to me. But in her interview that I listened to, Megan Nolan calls her Carmel. So I felt totally justified in calling her Carmel, even though it sounded like a Halloween Carmel Apple to me. So we have, in fact, uh, the word Carmel, and then underneath it, we have the following. The night the child went missing, Carmel sat a few miles away in the window of a cafe in Broccoli. She was breathing hard, cloud on the glass. Passing by, a man glanced in to check her prettiness and was struck by the intensity of her face behind the patch of steam, which partially obscured it. She ignored the gentle rattle of plates and hiss of chips, which went on behind her, hearing nothing. When she let herself pour over memories, she was hawkish, filled with greed for one of the only pleasures remaining to her, raking through lost evenings and moments, it was rare that she did allow herself this. It had been so long that there could only be a handful more times. It would not always be possible to summon precisely the fast fading textures and tastes. So this first paragraph is so interesting and really is doing a lot of important work in signaling where the novel is going. It is, again, a, a third-person narration. We're talking about Carmel from a distance. Someone is saying Carmel did this, she did that, she's sitting behind the window. So it's important here to think about reflections in this book. She is sitting in front of glass, um, but it is not, in fact, a mirror. She cannot see herself, and it is also, she cannot see through the window either. So she has this very obscured vision, and it, she is obscuring it herself with her breath. She's steaming up this window, so she's, she's able to not see her own reflection, which you would be able to see um, at night in a cafe like this, um, you know, your own reflection against the dark window. But, but she's also, um, so that is obscured. And it is not, in fact, a, a mirror. She's not wanting to look um, at herself in this present moment. She's wanting to look back in time, but sort of the future and what is right in front of her is obscured. There's also an enormous amount of tension that is built right at the beginning because we have this idea that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, her memories are the best thing she has and that, in fact, they are fading. Okay, and then we have this next paragraph from Carmel's perspective. When the child was missing, while the courtyard was lighting up with drama and anguish, Carmel was thinking about sex. So this is such an important part of the book, and I, I love the fact that it is signaled to us right at the beginning. I love going back and reading something like this after you have finished the book, because a good writer will signal so much stuff in the beginning here, and then will really gratify all of those introductions with a lot of excellent development. And in fact, 
Carmel is someone for whom sex is very important throughout the book. And when we start talking about shame, we are going to take a close look at how she feels about her body and her relationship with shame, which is so fascinating. But she is someone um, who, who had a real desire and, and, and really wanted um, to have, you know, sexual intimacy with this man that she fell in love with. And, and it was something, in fact, that ended very badly for her. It ended in pregnancy and changed her entire life. But she still is looking back on these memories as sort of, you know, the only thing that she can really think about. It's very important, too, that, that she's far away from what is happening. Um, she is being neglectful of her daughter. She has left her daughter with her brother, and her brother is, in fact, someone who is not able to care for a young child because he is so drunk all the time. Um, but so she she is being very neglectful. And, then, and But you get this sense at the beginning that she is someone who, in fact, deserves our sympathy. So very soon after this introduction on page three, in fact, it's on page seven, so just a mere four pages later, Look at me doing that math. We actually have the, the narration um, moving to Tom. And Tom Hargreaves is, in fact, the tabloid reporter. And we have this, this introduction of him here. And we're not going to read this, but one of the things that's very interesting here, of course, is that we have this idea of Carmel as sitting um, you know, in front of this window. And we have our very first introduction of Tom as, um, that was totally redundant. We have our introduction of Tom as, um, as looking at himself in a mirror. So we have both of these people looking into these reflective or potentially reflective surfaces. And I love that Nolan is giving us that parody right from the start. So there is a certain amount of um, you know, sympathy and a certain amount of, uh, like we're supposed to have them, I think, um, not on equal footing exactly, but we're supposed to see both of them as people who are complicated and people who are both, you know, good and evil. Um, you know, we have Carmel being neglectful. And then we have Tom, who really wants the approval of his boss, but he was also involved in this work that we have to really um, not have great feelings about. So both of them are presented with these reflective surfaces, but also, um, you know, they are, they're given to us in all of their complexity in a way that I really love. And it signals to us that as we go through the novel, and this is in fact the case, as we are introduced to one character after the next, um, and we are look, we are um, you know sort of close to them in this close third perspective, and um, as we are getting to know them, in each case we are uh, really able to appreciate both the really positive aspects of the person, and then also uh, the ways in which these people are really falling short. So again, I am really interested in the idea of, of how often the word shame came up in this novel. Um, and I want to take a close look at just a few instances where shame came up. They're very quick little clips. And then I want to take a look at the way in which Carmel is related to shame throughout the novel. OK, we're going to look on page 52 and 53. Interestingly, we feel a lot of, um, we feel from Tom like he has a lot of shame, but the word shame is not um, quite as often mentioned in relationship to him. It is, in fact, related uh, more to the Green family. And I don't know enough about Catholicism to have a real sense of this. Um, I, I, I do know that, like, Catholic guilt is like a total thing. Um, you know, from, from the people I know who are Catholic, they, they really feel a lot of guilt and are not always that happy about how much guilt they have received from their religion. Um, and I imagine with guilt maybe comes some shame. I, for some reason, I associate also Catholicism with shame. And um, I, also, I'm, I a long, long time ago realized the difference between um, being uh, ashamed of something and being embarrassed by something. And for those of you who haven't really thought this through and parsed it, I think it's a very important thing to clarify at this point. And, and it was so kind of foundational for me in some ways when I think about embarrassment and shame. So embarrassment is, is the idea that you're embarrassed by, by something uh, that you potentially did, uh, but it's not something that you internalize. It's like, you know, you're embarrassed that you did something, but that was sort of an anomaly for you. Whereas if you're ashamed of something, it has to do with, with who you are. So it's, it's sort of like internalized embarrassment and in lots of ways is much more destructive. So we see on page 52 when things are really going wrong for the Green family, we have um, John, who is the father, saying this to Carmel. We need to agree to a plan, said John finally. What are you on about, Carmel asked, shaking her head. We don't need a plan because we haven't done anything and neither has Lucy. So there's nothing to be afraid of. There's plenty to be afraid of. If we were angels, there would still be plenty to be afraid of here, and I think it's fair to say that we aren't that, do you? 
Do you, Carmel? You're a stupid old man. Nobody cares about anything I've done or Richie or you. There's plenty you've done that you should be ashamed of, but they won't care about that, although maybe they should. We are nobody. Do you think newspapers are interested in who slept with whose wife and who drinks too much and who had an argument over land 30 years ago? They only care about who murdered Mia and it wasn't Lucy, so we've nothing to hide. So the reason I flagged this part is um, this is one of the first, you know, mentions of the word shame. And she says to him, you know, to her father, there's plenty you should be ashamed for. It's such a brutal thing to say. And then lists all of these things. And again, this falls under the category of ordinary human failings. She sees these things as very mundane and, and very sort of run of the mill. And, and yet she also acknowledges that we should be ashamed of them, that her family should be ashamed of them. But this idea of shame, once it is introduced here, is really pervasive. So on page 90, we have the mother, who is Rose, uh, reflecting on shame. So this is, this is when Rose is um, feeling so sad because her, uh, the, the family gravesite where her mother and father are buried is really not being um, kept up well by her sister. And this is such an interesting figurative language thing. We have talked on the Fox page about um, how you can look at a house or you can look at a garden in literature as, as sort of a symbol and sort of emblematic of how the family uh, who lives in that house or tends that garden is doing. But um, this idea of the graveyard is kind of an extension of that. It's very much like a garden site. Um, and it, the fact that it is being unkempt is very symbolic of the fact that, um, you know, this is a family that is literally sort of gone to seed because of all the weeds growing up around the parents, uh, around the parents' grave sites. So Rose says the following, she was shaken at the thought of the visible neglect going on without her knowledge. The idea of other families stepping around the mess, tutting. It was not a bearable shame. So the idea of this neglect is, is also, of course, like really um, a very strong parallel to the neglect that is happening in her family, neglect that increases after her death. But the fact that she says it was not an, it was not a bearable shame is so forceful because in fact, it is a shame that she has to bear. There's nothing that she can do about this. It seems like kind of a minor thing too, but the fact that that is not bearable speaks volumes about all of the other things that she would be ashamed about. It's really so powerful. Then we have on page 108, this is one of the few times that we have the word caramel, that we have the word shame associated with caramel. She realized with a spark of quick shame that she did not have an intuitive sense of what level of cognition Lucy was operating under when it came to such matters. So she is in fact ashamed that she in fact doesn't know sort of like w where her child is in terms of abstract thought. So it, it, this does seem like something that in fact would produce shame if you uh, don't know in fact sort of what level uh, on which they are operating. Um, on page 114, we actually have a pretty interesting look at shame uh, as immigrants. This is Richie, who is the brother who um, has such serious alcohol problems. And he's talking to Tom. I don't know what job I thought I'd get with a leaving certificate and six weeks experience in a Waterford cafe, but there's always some bit of you that still believes the streets are paved with gold horse shite, no matter how many broke winos come home or worse, die here too ashamed to go home. So, you know, here you have this deep shame at the idea that, you know, that a lot of Irish people are thinking that England is going to offer opportunity when, in fact, if you don't have many skills and you are not uber educated, um, that, in fact, the opportunities are very few. But the fact that you wouldn't even be able to return home because you would be so ashamed is really difficult. And in fact, a um, bit of a spoiler here, uh, but Richie does not, in fact, return home. So you do have this sense that, that he is really, um, you know, sort of uh, overtaken by his shame and, and is one of these casualties of, of the kind of shame that comes from being undereducated and from, um, you know, being a victim of poverty and, and from having circumstances like your sister not being able to have an abortion. I mean, these are really sort of, and also, uh, you know, having a genetic predisposition toward alcohol abuse. You know, in fact, they are very much a matter of circumstance, and yet they shape his entire life really seriously. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go ahead and read these last three, but I think you really get the gist about the shame. What is interesting 
is that a lot of these have to do um, with men. So we did read an example with Rose and we read an example with Carmel, um, but a lot of them are, are um, both Richie and his father John and, and this really deep shame that these two men feel. It's also very interesting to me to take a look at the lack of shame that Carmel has around her body. So this is a point that is made again and again, and I was so interested in it. And it's it's really very striking, um, th this notion of of her as as having um, a comfort in her body uh, that that is really notable and that is something that that is detailed in ways that really make it kind of a prominent feature in the novel. So if we look at page four, so this is like one page into the novel, and this is when she is looking through these precious memories and understands that, you know, with too much use, these memories will no longer, um, you know, sort of uh, give her what they do uh, at this point. She's talking about having been with this man uh, who she really loves, um, but who, in fact, she gets pregnant by and he's older. Although this is, again, one of these kind of ordinary things about the book. She's 17 and he's 23. And yes, that is a very large age gap, but it's not like a crazy age gap. And again, this is part of this ordinariness that comes again and again and again in the book. These are not super sensational, uh, you know, instances of, of what has happened in this family. They're, in fact, relatively mundane, uh, um, you know, uh, events that have kind of conspired to really cause this family problems. She's talking about these memories. These two were divisible, the disbelieving ecstasy on his face when she first parted her legs and let him see her with light without shame. So again, this idea of, of really exposing herself to him with the light, you know, and really like the most sort of, um, you know, shameful parts of herself, um, she's really showing him her vagina without shame, which is just really, it's, it's a little startling here on page four. And it's really um, important because this is a theme that sort of moves through the whole, uh, the whole book. So this comfort with her body comes up again later um, in a, this very interesting thing when she's talking about how in her home she has very little privacy and, and that makes sense. It would have been a small home and, um, you know, a family that is is sort of not, uh, you know, not like wandering around naked. You get the sense that the Green family was, in fact, um, you know, repressed in lots of uh, really uh, significant ways. So we have this idea of her not having any privacy at home and then um, finding ways, in fact, to really appreciate her own body. So um, on the bottom of page 59, there was little time to dig into herself to try to confirm the suspicion which had been growing in her recently that she might be interesting. At school sometimes, she locked herself in a toilet and wrote in her diary and used her compact mirror to investigate different parts of herself. There were the stolen probing moments and there were her weekly cinema outings where she submerged herself beneath her big flamboyant emotions and communed with the actresses, trying to feel as swept up in the parts as they were. So it's so interesting that this idea of, um, you know, when she goes to the cinema, that is where she meets, in fact, this guy, Derek. And um, but but the idea of going to the cinema and the freedom of it and, and the sort of the able uh, the, the ability to explore the world through the movies is equated with this idea of exploring her body, um, you know, in the privacy of, of a like a school bathroom, which, again, it's interesting that she is is looking for ways to uh, explore her own body. And, you know, obviously we have to be thinking that she's using her compact in order to look at her genitalia, look at her vagina. I mean, maybe she's looking at all sorts of parts of her body that she can't see. Um, but, you know, really, I think we are led to think that she is, in fact, uh, getting to know her own body. And she is doing this in a public place, which you have this idea of, of the private and the public in this book as being very um, fluid boundary, this idea of, of what is public and what is private. And of course, tabloids, in fact, are all about bringing stuff from the private sphere into the public sphere. But you have this community that they all live in and all the children being together in Schuyler Square as very much a kind of a shared public slash private place. And in their own home is where Carmel feels sort of least able to, uh, you know, like 
explore herself and in fact needs to find a private space within the public realm of her school. So it's really interesting that again that has to do with the body and it has to do with looking. Again we have another reflective surface here. She is looking in fact at her vagina and she is sharing her vagina with her young lover Derek O'Toole. Um, in the light you know this is like bringing parts of her body that normally um, I think people can feel quite ashamed of uh, into the light and, and really admire admiring them and thinking that she might be someone who has some interesting parts of herself. It's really it's it's really cool in lots of ways that like her sense that she might be interesting is tied to this idea of actually her vagina. Then on page 70, um, we, we sort of return to this idea of her comfort, her like ability to feel comfortable when she is naked with her young lover. She surprised herself by not feeling nervous to be naked in front of him. She believed what he told her about how rare and perfect she was and assumed correctly that his beliefs would apply to her body also. So you have this really beautiful idea, not only that she is appreciating her body, but that that is something that is reflected by Derek O'Toole. So um, the tragic part of all of this is that as she is, um, you know, again and again, sort of speaking to this real uh, appreciation of her body and, and really understanding the magnitude of, of her body and her vagina in particular, her sexuality, um, as she is appreciating, appreciating all of that, the reader, um, you know, knows on some level that in fact she is going to end up getting pregnant and having to leave the country. And it is so striking that when she does realize she's pregnant, there is so much that happens with her body that the, that the word shame is not, um, it, it's like too big to even use the word shame. So she, do, she does that kind of um, mental thing where she like really convinces herself that she is not pregnant. But even before that, she really tries to do a lot of damage to her body. So there's that one scene where she's running and running and running. There's another scene um, where she is actually you know, taking a very hot bath and drinking a lot of gin. Then there's the harrowing scene where she, in fact, tries to induce um, an abortion. She tries to give herself an abortion. And it is so awful and so sad because, in fact, she can't even do it. It's like the pain is not even the problem, but it's just like her body is not cooperating with her. So you have these kind of really notable moments. And then you have long periods of her starving herself. You have this idea of the body as being something that, you know, is a point of, of, of real sort of um, self-esteem for her. And then you have kind of this betrayal on the part of the body and then this full rejection of her body in a way that is so painful. It's interesting, too, to note that John Green's first wife, so the mother of Richard, Richie Green, uh, John's first wife was a, a different woman. Her name was Louise. Um, it is not uh, Rose, who is the mother of Carmel. But you have um, this woman, Louise, who is someone who is really dedicated to sex and someone who um, is really interested in having a lot of sex. And John Green, in fact, the father of both Richie and Carmel, is someone for whom sex is just not that big a deal. In fact, it says, you know, he, he was fine, like having sex once or twice a week was fine, but it wasn't the important part about how he loved this woman. What he loved about her was being able to be vulnerable and, and to be able to sort of need her, like to feel very needy and not to be ashamed of feeling needy. And so Louise, um, much like Carmel in the very beginning of the novel, really pursues sexual experiences on her own in a way, um, I'm not sure we can read it as like really like, uh, you know, empowering, but it is a depiction of sex that's very, uh, it, it's very important to see that as a way for women to take power and a way for them um, to have some sort of uh, either appreciation of their bodies or to have some sort of independence or to um, make themselves feel better about, uh, you know, their home situation. So it's very interesting that we have Louise as kind of, um, She's not a foil for Carmel. Well, she kind of is. Oh, see, I said Carmel. She's not a foil for Carmel, but she, she is a little bit because she is someone um, who, in fact, you know, has a baby within marriage, but, but also is able to leave the family and, you know, presumably in order to pursue, pursue her own, uh, you know, sexual experiences and, and her own relationships with, with other men. So we are going to talk briefly about the narrative voice, uh, and then we are going to talk very quickly about tension and then get to the close of the novel. 
So the narrative voice, we talked about it, um, you know, we've talked about it a bit throughout this entire talk today. These different points of view, these different perspectives are really interesting. It's funny, that is a, um, it's kind of a tried and true way uh, to, to write novels. You know, you have lots of books that, that are structured in this way. And I think in some um, lesser writer's hands, it can feel a little gimmicky. It's, it's kind of a, um, it, it's known as being like a somewhat easier way to sort of give like full rounded depictions of all of the different characters. But in no way in Megan Nolan's hands does this feel like a gimmick or does it feel like sort of too easy or or that she's, um, you know, sort of taking the easy way out. So, and I will say that, uh, you know, I was very interested in the parts by Carmel and the parts by uh, Tom, and I would have been satisfied to go back and forth between the two of them. When we first saw that John was going to have a narration and then we saw that Richie was going to have a narration, I believe Rose as well, um, I was a little like, oh gosh, like I think this is going to be a little bit tedious. And in, in some ways, I, I did feel like I wanted to rush a tiny bit through the parts um, of Richie and of John. But actually, John's part I found actually very interesting because of Louise and, and because it was piecing together a lot of different parts of the story. Richie's part I found very affecting uh, in, in the sense of, of what happens with him in his work life. Uh, but I felt like it was a, just a tiny bit long where it was talking about, um, you know, his younger years and, and his... Uh, his relationship with alcohol. But but what I really want to underscore is the way that this structure of seeing the, the sort of close third, so we're not, it's not that each of the people are saying, I did this and I did that, and here's what I think of Carmel, and here's what I think of Rose, um, although you have a little bit of that. But, but we have this close third narrator who keeps a nice amount of distance. It's important to me that the narrator is distanced from these people, because I think this is a story about not fully comprehending things, about not being able to know someone and not being able to fully understand, you know, someone's perspective or someone's motivations. So it's very important to me that we have this third person narrator to maintain the distance. But I also really like the way that all of these different perspectives allow us, uh, you know, a very full picture of the family. So that later in the novel, when things are kind of um, coming to a head, what we have this really strong sense of, of both understanding the backgrounds of these people, but also sympathy because we have been kind of in their worlds. It's a very effective structure, and I think that uh, Megan Nolan does a very good job of it. One other kind of slight quibble that I have with this structure and the way that she uses it is um, that sometimes it, it feels a little out of voice. I didn't want her to like use some dialect for each one and I didn't want her to like, you know, have a totally different verbiage when she's talking about Rose and then like a completely different, you know, sort of language when she's talking about Richie. But sometimes the diction would be so inflated that I would be like, this really seems sort of out of voice. So I want to read just two very quick examples of times where I was like, this does not seem like language uh, that, that Carmel would be using. So on page 57, there are lots of examples of this, and I think most people wouldn't be bothered by it. And I certainly didn't feel um, like it, this was not a big detractor for me, but, but there were times when I was like, mm, I'm not sure that we needed you know this exact word. So uh, this is when Carmel is talking uh, in 1978, when she is first realizing that she might be pregnant. She says, Some of the first warnings of pregnancy were not unlike the physical markers she had experienced when falling in love. So physical markers, to me, felt a little clinical. Um, and then we have this. There was the gaping feeling in her chest, which swooped in without warning and winded her. I liked that. So like the gaping feeling that swooped in um, without warning and winded her. I love all the, the repetition of the W's there. I love all of those vowels. I love swooped. I love this idea of like this feeling in her chest, this gaping feeling. All of that to me felt um, really like in voice and, and really very strong. And then um, we go back into this somewhat clinical voice. There was a vague nausea and dread at all times. There was the comically heightened emotional life, everything living just on the surface. So this idea of comically heightened emotional life, comically heightened, again, also seems to me like it, it just seemed a little bit too kind of writerly, a little bit um, like words that a narrator would use and not Carmel. Again, I, I wasn't expecting all of it to be like in her voice, but this idea of, of, uh, of, of sort of like really heightened language seemed a little out of voice. On page 68, we have another example of this. So this is when she's with Derek. 
She had gone from never having a boyfriend, only a few tepid kisses with nobodies, to the strange emotional sophistication she seemed to now inhabit. So again, I like this, and I think if I, I think if we weren't switching from person to person, I wouldn't really have noticed this as much. Um, but the strange emotional sophistication, I mean, I guess we can chalk that up to this distance that I really liked. I liked the idea that the narrator like didn't know everything about them, and partially it is probably this somewhat inflated diction, this writerly diction that allows me, um, you know, that distance. But but it felt um, a little bit out of voice, and then particularly because that kind of inflated diction um, was also used for other characters. So it would feel out of voice with Richie or with Rose in ways that I was like, hmm, like it just felt a little bit, uh, like a little bit more uh, clinical or more sort of highfalutin uh, than, than, than um, th what I would like, in fact, for these kind of ordinary lives. We're going to talk briefly now about the um, about the incredible way that uh, that Megan Nolan is providing tension and pacing through the novel, and then we'll look at the close. So the tension and pacing in the novel again, we're looking here at, at something that is essentially a thriller, and uh, pacing is simply the way in which information is meted out over the course of a book. So in this case, in a thriller, it has to be meted out very carefully, and she does it so well. So some examples, um, if we look quickly on page five, we have this time, um, we're not going to look at the quotation, but essentially um, what happens is Carmel asks her father and Richie to watch the watch Lucy for a couple of days. And is like, you can watch her for two days, right? And as the reader, you're like, oh, oh no, like what's going to happen in those two days? And in fact, a lot of bad things do happen. Um, and, and you have this sense of like, is it a good idea to have them watch her baby? Or her 10-year-old child, um, it's interesting how much the 10-year-old the Lucy is in fact infantilized because she is in fact, like nobody quite is paying enough attention to her to understand, you know, who she is or how old she is or how she's operating. Um, but but you have this sense here of real foreboding. And it happens again and again. Um, th there are a couple of different points where um, it's even when there's a red herring. At one point, we're like, oh, what happened to Rose? And it turns out, in fact, that Rose is, um, you know, like, something very mundane has happened to her. But even in the cases where it seems like a tiny bit of a red herring, you still are like, oh my gosh, the tension is really palpable and, and feels very well, um, well paced in the sense that it is meted out well across the book. On page 54, I do want to look at this one important example. Um, it, and this speaks also to the nuance of the different perspectives that we have here. So Richie um, and, and John and Carmel are trying to figure out, the, the three of them in the Green family are trying to figure out um, what, what their sort of story is going to be uh, when they are, um, you know, first together with Tom, the, the reporter. Our narrator says about Richie, he was stung by the unfairness of it all, Carmel and his father ganging up on him and getting on the moral high horse, them, so part of me is like, oh my God, wait, why is Richie so, like, why does he think they can't be on their moral high horse? Like, what have they done? And um, this is part of the beauty of the novel is because they haven't done anything extremely out of the ordinary. I mean, what has happened is, you know, poor John was jilted by his first wife and is totally emotionally unavailable and feels like less of a man because he cannot work and is, you know, filled with shame. So he is a man who, um, you know, is, is someone who's had all sorts of ordinary tragedies. And Carmel's only real failing, or her main failing early on, was that she got pregnant and couldn't have an abortion, which is not her fault. So, I mean, getting pregnant is kind of her fault, but that is also, I'm going to put that also on the state because I can guarantee or not guarantee, I imagine in 1980, when she got pregnant, that not a lot of people in Ireland uh, were giving her sex education or condoms. I don't even think, I think like literally until like 1986 or something, you had to have a prescription to have condoms in the UK. I mean, in Ireland, I don't know what um, Derek and Carmel were using, and I'm not sure why she thought she wasn't going to get pregnant, but we have this sense of her as not doing anything like crazy. Like these are all kind of mundane tragedies that befall this family. 
But your curiosity is piqued when you're like, oh my gosh, why does Richie think they shouldn't be on their high horse? And in fact, at this early point in the book, we're about a quarter of the way in, I was like, is there incest? Like, did they murder the young child? Like, you have all of these thoughts that are really displaced because we are expecting something sensational, and largely that is because of the media. It's so beautifully underscoring this idea that we really expect our media to be very sensational, whether it is a tabloid from 1990 or whether it's like BuzzFeed or all the clickbait or even People Magazine, my beloved people. And, you know, the sensational aspect is so undercut by the fact that these people are so ordinary. It's really masterfully done. And this happens again and again. We have all of these kind of beautiful tensions that are built. And then we have even this kind of, um, you know, cliffhanger at the bottom of the page, just after we have Richie talking about, um, you know, this idea of them being on their high horse. Down at the bottom here, um, Carmel says, I fucking hate you, Carmel said to him. Well, I fucking hate you both, Richard replied. At the top of the stairs, Tom listened. So you're like, dun, dun, dun. You know, like you have this guy who's kind of scheming, who's trying to get all of this information about them and is overhearing them say all of these things that, that, that he wants them to be sensational when in fact they are totally mundane. But the beautiful way that Megan Nolan is kind of upping all of the tension is really masterful. Okay, the last thing we're going to do here is talk about the close of the book. So the end of the book really beautifully uh, sort of concludes what we need it to conclude, but also leaves enough, um, uh, you know, it's not like too tidy. It's not too, too much tied in a bow here. It's really, really beautifully done. And it's really sad and it's really poignant. I really am happy that we read the section earlier about Richie talking about shame and the fact that um, people were too ashamed to come home because in fact, he is one of the real, uh, one of the real tragedies of the book because in fact, he is one of those people who is too ashamed to come home. So happily, um, we do in fact have Carmel, her father and Lucy returning. And there's some beautiful descriptions of the house again. Remember, when you are reading anything that is, um, you know, worth its weight uh, in literary gold, um, you should, in fact, be looking at the house as a symbol for, uh, you know, how the family is doing. And there's some beautiful descriptions of the house. But at the end here, we have this really um, gorgeous and I think very, like, a measured and very realistic sort of take uh, that Carmel is telling us. So this is on 215. There were things she couldn't describe, things she would never know. Richie was all but lost to them now, almost always unreachable, surfacing back in Waterford just once for Christmas in 1993 and then disappearing again. She could not speak enough to take up the absences of others, but she could recite her own sort of prayers to fill the space of her former silences. She could provide room for her daughter to do the same. In that space, she hoped the lineaments of her original apology, so negligible in its merely spoken form, would become evident and concrete. The apology she could not voice eloquently, the one which would never end and which she pushed toward Lucy and the girl whose life she had taken and toward herself each morning that she woke, thinking, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thinking the mantra Richie had once told her he used to lull him to sleep. I'm a good person and other people think so too. It's so good. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. This idea of, of um, Richie as sort of having the last word adds to this real poignance about him not having sort of resurfaced and him not having been consoled enough by this mantra to feel okay about himself. We're getting back to this notion of other people's impressions of us. We're getting back to the idea that, you know, other people have everything to do with our self-esteem and that families and communities can really do a lot of damage. And in this case, this idea that she's trying so hard to create opportunities for herself and for her daughter, and it's all these beautiful ideas of, of words, you know, it's prayers and it's mantras, and a lot of the words are unspoken. She can't speak in these spaces enough to sort of bring people back or, or, to, or to sort of give her daughter, you know, these family members who are not there anymore. But, but she is able to fill it with prayers. And the idea of a liniment, um, I, I think is so beautiful here because it 
it's like a, um, I feel like it's like a salve. So this idea, I mean, talk about diction, that's a little bit out of uh, word, but it's so, it feels very Catholic to me, which I don't even know if it is, but it feels kind of witchy and kind of old world. But this idea that, that she would be able to provide a salve with this apology is so, it's so meaningful and so beautiful. And that this mantra at the end that she is working with, it didn't in fact work for Richie. Uh, and it's interesting how much it, it sort of hinges on other people's opinion. But you do have this sense of a very slight optimism at the end, which is a real gift, I think, from Megan Nolan. So um, I hope that today's talk has been uh, enlightening and that you have um, maybe a little better appreciation for how incredibly well done this novel is. And I hope you head back to the Foxed page and find something else to listen to. Happy reading. Happy reading.